Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to The front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Network, 1350 on your AM dial, serving the New York metropolitan area. Please be sure to download the Veritas Catholic Radio Network mobile app so that you can have access to all of our station's content. And also, please follow Joe and I. We're really trying to build up our presence on YouTube. So Frontline TV, the Frontline TV uh, is primarily where you can find Joe and I on YouTube. But wherever you see us out there, like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. Do something that's going to help us out and get the truth out there that so desperately is needed uh, in our country right now. And we... Mm. At the front line with Joe and Joe, we're very pleased and honored to be welcoming, welcoming back to the front line with Joe and Joe, Dr. John Bergsma. And we are going to be discussing his new book, The Word of the Lord, Reflections on the Sunday Mass Readings for Year C. Those of you out there who don't know Dr. Bergsma, I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you don't, uh, I want to give John a brief introduction. Dr. John Bergsma is professor of theology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. A former Protestant pastor, Dr. Bergsma has authored several books on scripture and the Catholic faith, including, including Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Revealing the Jewish Roots of the Church, and a Catholic Introduction to the Bible, Old Testament with Dr. Brant Petrie. Dr. Bergsma speaks regularly for parish missions, diocesan conferences, clergy convocations, and other events nationally and internationally. He and his wife Dawn reside with their eight children in Steubenville, Ohio. Now, this is what the very Reverend Paul Scalia, Episcopal Vicar for the Clergy of the Diocese of Arlington, had to say about the book. Quote, over the past several years, many priests have found in John Bergsma's scripture commentaries a great resource, both for their own prayer and for Sunday homilies. Now we have his cogent, scholarly, and timely reflections on the Sunday readings gathered together in one book for a liturgical year. This volume will benefit both priests and laity alike in preparing for and getting the most out of Sunday's sacred text. May it be the first of many, close quote. Dr. John Bergsma, welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe, brother. Hey, great to be with you, Joe and Joe. It's awesome. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent. Right. I'm looking forward. This is going to be a lively conversation. Uh, but, but as always, let the Holy Spirit guide it. We'll start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Son, Spirit, Son. Amen. amen. Remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O oh, Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency, hear and answer us. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Amen. amen. I would say right off the bat, just I, I want to emphasize to our audience that, you know, we have authors on and, and we want to bring them on because they have something to say. There's something there for all of us to learn. I mentioned Dr. Brant Petrie in the introduction. Dr. Bergsma works closely with Brant Petrie. We're going to get into it in this conversation. I'm going to hand it right over to Joe Resinello. We need to be better with scripture. And I, I, I just use the word better. We need to be better with scripture and resources like like what what Dr. Bergsma is providing, along with many others. We have to avail ourselves of these resources. We need to know scripture like the back of our hand. Having said that, Joe Resinello, where are we headed? Well, John, I think a good place to start just to set the stage is your book um, provides, obviously, a commentary alongside uh, the Sunday's readings for year C. Now, some people may not understand what that means, year C. Obviously, uh, our readings are structured. Um, I believe there are three. Um, could you kind of just set that stage, and then I think we can get into the meat and potatoes of the book? Oh, definitely. You know, I totally sympathize. A lot of folks, they show up for Mass, and, <laughs> you know, you hear these readings from the Bible. You don't know where they're coming from and what the rationale is. So it's good to give a little background uh, on this. But, um, you know, Joe, as you know, after the Vatican Council uh, back in the 60s, what they did was they revised the cycle of Bible readings for Mass, and they gave us a new cycle. And, uh, you know, before the 60s, back in the Latin Mass, there was just the same cycle every year. But now what we have is a three-year cycle where we follow one of the first three Gospels uh, every year. So we have what's called year A, where we follow Matthew, and then year B, which is closing up right now, 
uh, ending up on uh, November 21st, Feast of Christ the King. That's the end of year B. And that was the Gospel of Mark. So we've been. 28, we're starting year C and we're going to follow Luke, which is many people's favorite gospel because it's got those great parables like the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. Everybody's favorite parables are from Luke. Plus, it's got all of the joyful mysteries are in Luke and only in Luke. So no Luke, no joy. So nice. That's, <clears throat> that's what does what's coming up for us in year C. So it's it's a great thing. And, you know, I, I, I think that lots of Catholics were just not aware that we're actually following one of the Gospels in the year. We're just kind of like not tuned into it. But that's actually what we're going to do. We're going to follow uh, Luke through uh, year C. And uh, it, it's just going to be beautiful. Why did you, you choose this. it? Uh, like C, choose? why did you choose C? I mean, just Luke obviously addresses the poor. Uh, that yep. is one of the themes of as Matthew addresses the Jewish community. Why did you choose that cycle? Well, I did. I choose all the cycles. See uh, what these books uh, I, I've written a commentary on all three cycles, as well as all the solemnities and feasts that, you know, that, that come on fixed days of the year. And what happened, uh, guys, was uh, I was doing a blog with my buddies and, and they said, hey, why don't we each take a turn? and write some commentary on the Bible readings for Mass. You know, you take one week, I'll take another, blah, blah, blah. We all said, okay, great. Well, what happened was, like the little red hand, uh, I was the only one who got my commentaries written for the blog, and the other guys did. So I would, you know, come around to Saturday, and they hadn't written anything. So i quick write something so that our blog readers would, would keep uh, reading. And over 10 years, I ended up writing commentaries on every single Sunday and feast day, and, and so on through the whole year. So the, uh, we, we published uh, year B and that's out. And, and, but, that, but year B is closing up now. We won't get it again for three years. And, uh, but now I've written year C uh, for, for Luke. And, uh, and we're gonna, uh, I've already written year A too, which is Matthew, which is awesome, but that's gonna be the following year. That's gonna be uh, 2022, uh, December of 2022. That's gonna start. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's how that came about. Let me ask you this, John, just out of curiosity. So um, just because I can hear people asking, what about John? <laughs> what about John? Yeah. Um, yeah. So now John is, is I mean, if, correct me if I'm wrong, because this is why we have you on, because Joe and I learn too, okay? Um, Easter week is heavy with the gospel of St. John. Uh, where else throughout the year do we maybe, let's say, put some emphasis on, on that gospel, on John's gospel? Sure. Sure, John. Uh, John gets mixed in in every single year. We get heavy doses of John uh, every year, and some places where that shows up is around Christmas. Uh, we get like John one, for example. Year we usually read a little bit from John one or two. Uh, well, we're getting the year started, the, the liturgical year started, and then in Lent. Uh, we get John oftentimes, especially as we're getting closer to Easter, we get more and more John. And then during the Easter season, we get heavy John as well. And then uh, on, in the Triduum, we get John. Like in good, on Good Friday, we always read the whole Passion narrative from John. So we get, yeah, these heavy doses of John in Lent and in Easter and in some other important feast days. And when you add it all up, we end up hearing most of John uh, on most years. Okay. I did not know that. <clears throat> I, I did not I, know, I didn't that. know that. He is my favorite. Uh, that is my favorite. Oh, for gospel, sure. For sure. To yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. I'm sorry. If you're just joining us, you're at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello with Dr. John Bergs, my friend of the show, speaking about his new book, The Word of the Lord, Reflections on Sunday Mass Reading for Year C. Sorry I cut you off, Joe R. No, it's okay. No, I mean, clearly, John, um, you know, you, you have a PhD and you're writing from a scholarly perspective. The intent of this book, is it for the laity or is it for the clergy or is it for both? I mean, um, you know, because obviously I think a lot of people, there's a lot of things out there, the Magnificat, the word among us out there that gives reflections. What's the, you know, intended audience of this, this book? Absolutely. It is for everybody. Uh, one audience is uh, priests, you know, who uh, are trying to, I mean, we think of our priests and they are so crushed with all the stuff that they got to do, you know? So they're always rushing, rushing, rushing. So I try to 
do the homework for them so that they can look over like the background of every reading that's going to happen on the Sunday or the feast day, give them, you know, some depth to it so that they can pick and choose and think and say, my parish needs to hear this. So I'm going to focus on that, you know, so I, I, did, I did that for priests, for them, but then for, for lay people too, I mean, folks, this is to help people get into the word of God. We have these awesome readings every Sunday that, that uh, some really holy scholars, you know, spent a lot of time praying over and thinking about like lining this all up with, with a very uh, strong intentionality. And then they just whiz right by. And, and usually our pastor only has 10 minutes to talk about them and he can only focus on one or two things. It's like, well, what about all the rest of the stuff that we read? So I think oh, there's a lot of lay people that want to get into these readings and really want to like, why, why is Holy Mother Church giving me this reading from Hosea, you know, this Sunday? A quick, you know, a spiritual uh, idea. It's like some in-depth stuff from a Bible scholar, but always looking, you know, ultimately towards application, towards like, how can my life change? So that was really my intention. I think too, with when, when you have, let's say works like yours, um, cause a lot of times, John, what you get is you have people say, well, why does the church teach it? I'm talking about Catholics. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what others think about the Catholic church. I'm talking about Catholics. Uh, well, why does the church teach this? Or why does the church do that? Or why does the church do that? My response you know, in the last couple of years, well, why don't you go and listen to the people? Yes. And I've mentioned you to people. I mentioned Dr. Brand Petrie to people. I said, if you want to know why the church does what it does, why don't you avail yourself of these resources? And then when you read scripture, kind of like it, it, it opens you up because now you understand context, which is a lot of times that's another problem with scripture is how people just rip things out of scripture and never give any kind of con context. Our Protestant brothers and sisters tend to do that somewhat. Um, but if you want to know why, well then, well then take the time and go buy John's book. Okay. The book is the word of the Lord reflections on Sunday mass readings for year C. And I would say this too, John, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Joe. What you're saying and what Joe is saying, what I hear in there is if you want to hear scripture, cause you don't have the time to read it, get to mass, get to mass. Christ. That's where you hear it. Absolutely. That's where you hear it. And that's where you experience it because the scripture is the word of God and Jesus is the word of God and he becomes flesh and he enters into you at mass. And so mass is the best place to reflect on scripture. And Joe and Joe, I mean, let me give testimony because, uh, you know, I was raised as a Protestant. I did not expect my appreciation for the word of God to improve when I became Catholic, I thought that's something that I had down. I thought I was like KFC, you know, they used to have those commercials. We do one thing right. I thought, you know, I do Bible right. You know, we Protestants, we do one thing right, Bible. I admit Catholics do a lot of other things better, but at least we got the Bible down. But then I converted and I began to receive Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. And all of a sudden it's like it went from black and white TV to color TV. And all of a sudden, I saw so much more in the scriptures. So I just want to give testimony to our listeners, our Catholic brothers and sisters. Don't feel like as a Catholic, you got to take a back seat when it comes to scripture. The, the church is the one that has been communicating scripture, preserving scripture, reflecting on scripture for centuries. The mass readings are so beautiful. Even Protestant scholars so admired our lectionary and our set of readings that a lot of Protestant denominations use it too. And, and that was the result of the Second Vatican Council. So I, I just want to give testimony to, to our listeners that your heritage as a Catholic is the word of God. Uh, go to mass, listen to what's being said, you know, use these resources like my book and, and others to get into that. It's so rich. It opens up a whole new world. And then you see the world through the Bible, through the word of God. And, the, and the, the world looks different when we look at it through the lens of the word of God. You know, John, Amen. I mean, clearly we've kind of touched on this and we could expand upon it. Um, Catholics could learn a little bit with regard to emphasis on the Bible. And Joe Pasillo said rightly, 
Um, you hear the Bible in mass. It's the best place to hear it, but we got to read it on our own. And outside of these resources that you're providing, what could you basically, you know, say to Catholics out there with regard to aiding them in, in their reading of scripture? I mean, I could speak for myself. I read it every day from the Magnificat. When I drink my coffee in the morning, I read the readings. Uh, it, it works for me. But what would you say to the Catholics out there who should be reading scripture daily as our Protestant brothers and sisters do? Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm going to say, first of all, is one of the best ways to do it, brothers, is to get an audio Bible. Okay, there's a great one from Lighthouse Media and Ignatius Press, uh, where uh, it's beautifully, beautifully read, and even to a certain extent, like acted. You know, like you can hear stuff in the background as they're as they're acting out these the scriptures. And I know everybody is so busy, but I know also, especially in our listener audience, you know, along the East Coast, there everybody's got a lot of uh, of, of commute time, right? A lot of transit time. You know, whether it's on the subway or whether you're in your car and you're trying to get into the city or whatever it is. And, you know, we can make use of those times to really imbibe the word of God. You know, you just put your headphones on and you pick up where you left off and you can do a chapter a day. That A chapter is like only five minutes, you know. It doesn't take long at all. You got 15 minutes, maybe you got an hour commute. In hour commute, you can you can read, a, 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 a listen to an entire epistle of St. Paul you know, in that time. So that is a great way of, of doing that. You can do it during your workout. You know, maybe you go to the gym, you put that in, you listen to the word of God during your workout instead of, you know, something else that maybe is not so edifying. So, you know, those are fantastic ways. We have a father, Mike Schmitz, had the number one podcast in America, which was going through the Bible in a year. Check out Father Mike Schmitz. I believe he's going to do it again this, this coming year as well. And that is just great leading uh, Catholics, you know, step by step from Genesis to Revelation over the course of a year. Uh, you know, I think it is resources like that, but it is worth it uh, at, at some point in our Catholic lives to, to read through to get the storyline at some point. Don't need to do that every year necessarily, but, um, but you know, once or twice. Uh, you know, you can to go through that gives you that whole context. And that's why what Father Mike Schmitz is doing is so awesome for uh, the Catholic Church in America. So those are those are some easy references. And, you know, uh, wor worst case scenario, just take a Bible and and read. Give yourself a commitment. Say, I'm going to read one chapter a day. I'm going to read two chapters a day and just keep it up. Keep it in the same place. Put it on the same place in your shelf. Don't leave it around the house because your kids will pick it up and they'll move it and then you won't be able to find it. You won't do it during your during your prayer hour, but keep it in the same place and just do those, those next two chapters. And you'd be amazed at how quickly you can move through the whole Bible. You know, you know, it's funny is, and I don't know why this just dawned on me. Okay, when I was living in Brooklyn, when I first met my wife, I was commuting on the subway and that's how I read the, the New Testament. All right, I had read it somewhat before in my life. Uh, but I was on the subway. It was a 45 minutes going, 45 Absolutely. minutes coming home. So I got an hour and a half worth of reading. And, and I, somebody had said at the time, similar to what you're saying right now, uh, why don't you read the Bible? And my wife for Christmas that year uh, got me the New Testament Navarre Bible. And it's in volumes. There's a lot of commentary there. For mostly, you know, obviously all of it is from tradition. And that's how I read the New Testament. And then when I was done on the subway, I read it again, <laughs> but, but now you're giving me an idea because I say I need to read the Old Testament, right? It's kind of like when you think of the Old Testament, John, it's kind of like you get the shakes a little bit. It's like, okay, the news <laughs> one thing. Now I got to go to the Old Testament, but now I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. download probably a light, lighthouse media app or whatever it is. Cause I still have an hour. I drive now, so I can't read while I'm driving, but I could listen to scripture on the way. So, and I would recommend anybody, if you're on the subway, read the Bible. If you're in your car, Lighthouse Media, um, and or Father Mike Schmitz, like you said. John, John I'm going to hand it over to you. John, a friend of mine, sadly, a number of years ago, left the church and he went to like a non-denominational non Bible chapel. And I he asked me to go to a Bible study. So I would go with him to try to witness the Catholic faith. I would try to ex basically dispel all of like the ideas that people had. And, and I'll be honest, I got I learned a lot from those guys and they were great guys and we became good friends. Um, but one thing I learned from that 
is they believe in Protestants. They believe in something what's called sola scriptura, which in translation is by scripture alone. Could you just explain, because you have that background, where do they go wrong with that approach to basically Christian worship? It is, Joe, and Joe, is that uh, scripture alone is unbiblical, okay? This idea of sola scriptura is actually not taught in the Bible. And when that dawned on me, that shook up my world, brothers, because I was, a, again, a devout Protestant. I was a pastor, or had been a pastor, had seminary degrees, etc. was going to the University of Notre Dame, and uh, I made this friend there, this guy named Michael, uh, who ended up becoming my sponsor to give away the, where the story goes. But, um, but I, was, I was debating with Michael and, and I was criticizing the way that the Catholic Church appealed to tradition. And, uh, and I was you know, doing my sola scriptura argument that the Bible alone should be our guide because the Bible alone is the word of God, blah, 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 blah. And it sounds all wonderful, sounds all pious. But uh, Michael came back to me and said, do you, do you, can you point to me any place in scripture that actually teaches um, uh, uh, sola scriptura, uh, you know, the Bible alone? And, uh, and there, there's a verse, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scripture is God breathed and useful for instruction and training in righteousness, etc. And that, that was our go-to verse. And he said, but let's look at that carefully. And so we looked at that verse together and it said, you know, all scripture is inspired. That's great. And it's useful and so on. But it does, it never says that scripture is all you need, you know, in fact, elsewhere, like in, uh, in second Thessalonians, uh, St. Paul says, hold fast to the traditions that were passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter and letter is the written uh, teaching of the apostles. And we have that in the new Testament epistles but word of mouth is tradition. Now, Joe and Joe, the, the interesting thing is in many Protestant Bibles, the, the three places where St. Paul tells the early Christians to hold fast to tradition, they don't translate it in English as tradition, even though the Greek word is tradition, they'll translate it with the, with the English word teaching. And I found that out because I was shocked when my, my Catholic friend, Michael, was showing me these passages about tradition in the New Testament. I went to my personal Bible, I opened up, and it didn't say tradition there. Well, I knew Greek because I had seminary training, so I went to the original language, and sure enough, it's the word tradition there. And here you have St. Paul saying, hold fast to the traditions. Well, this is the thing too, brothers, is that the table of contents of the Bible, okay, the, the list of sacred books that belong there, it's not part of any biblical book per se. Chronicle books, that was passed down by tradition. And, and this is the Achilles heel of that whole Sola Scriptura argument. If you give up on tradition, you quite literally give up on the table of contents of your Bible. You don't have an authority for which books are inspired. And we know that uh, Protestant Bibles are missing some Old Testament books because they went with the Jewish tradition rather than with the tradition of the apostles in terms of what the table of contents should be for the Bible. So in so many ways, I mean, I, I, just, taught, I just taught about this a, a couple of days ago in my scripture classes on campus, but you know, it, what I discovered, and I was even talking about this yesterday with some friends, what I discovered was when you give up on tradition, you end up losing scripture too. You know, tradition, uh, the church's tradition is what tells us that this is the word of God. The church's tradition is what has the, so to speak, the table of contents. The church's tradition also has um, the, the understanding, the, the interpretations of God's word so that you don't get derailed and go off into some crazy ideas. You know, you got to stay anchored with how uh, Christian faithful uh, have understood God's word through the centuries. And if you give up on that kind of, you, the, what happens is you, you cut the keel off of your boat and you start blowing around with some, with these crazy interpretations. And that's why I experienced the Protestant world where like 50,000 denominations, literally over 50,000 denominations in, in the USA, all 
arguing about these different interpretations because they cut the keel off of their boat and they're just blowing around with, uh, you know, the most persuasive Bible scholar or preacher who comes along with a new idea about how to interpret a certain passage. So I know that was probably more than... Uh, no, it's no, good. No, no, it's, it's important for people to know, John, because, and you're joining us at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Racinello being joined by our good friend, Dr. John Bergsman. We're talking about the word of the Lord, his new book, Reflections on the Sunday Mass Readings for Year C. John, that's one thing I found with, with um, and let's, let's be clear, when we're talking about Protestants in America, we're primarily, I think, talking about evangelicals, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that many times, and I've had these respectful conversations, not, I don't want to call them arguments, even though I could argue. Um, when you hear like, well, you guys rely on tradition. I said, well, so do you. I said, you have tradition that just goes back a, 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 a little bit more recent in human history. Ours goes back 2000 years, but you have tradition. Yeah, but you, who makes the Pope the authority? Well, who made your pastor the authority? In other words, why do you even go, why do you even go and gather on Sunday? In other words, if you, if it's, if it's subjective interpretation of scripture, if that's what it is, if it's me, Jesus and the Bible, then why do you go and listen to that pastor preach? You are making him an authority, yet you rail against the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church actually has authority given to it by Jesus. OK, um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of inconsistencies. And again, we pray for the conversion of all people. OK, we want everybody in the Catholic Church. But part of doing that is to say to them, guys, you have to check yourselves, because as much as you rail against these things, you kind of do the same thing. Pray Absolutely. for my conversion too, Joe. I'm still yes, working yes. on it. <laughs> Listen, I pray, I pray first and foremost for myself. <laughs> yes, praise But John, Lord, what's Joe. your comments on that? Uh, we have a we have a, like a minute or two, or about a couple of minutes before the break, but what's your comments on how like the arguments against the Catholic Church, uh, th those who make the arguments seem to be doing the same thing just in a different way? Absolutely. And what, what shocked me was when my seminary professors started talking about the Calvinist tradition, because, you know, uh, I was a Calvinist, you know, follower of John Calvin. That would be like Presbyterians and churches that call themselves Reformed. You know, there in northern New Jersey, you get like uh, some some older uh, Dutch Reformed churches there um, that go back to John Calvin. And and my seminary professors would talk about the Reformed tradition. And I said, I, I oppose. I said, hey, wait, wait, Catholics are about, are about tradition. We're Protestants. We're not supposed to be about tradition. And one of my professors took me aside. It's like, you know, look, that's a little bit simplistic. We actually do have a tradition, you know, and the Baptists have a tradition and the Greek Orthodox have a tradition and the Catholic have a tradition. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, like whose tradition is, is binding on everybody? I mean, what's the true tradition here? And, and that, and they didn't have a good answer for that at the time, but that was, that started me on my journey toward, toward the Catholic church eventually, because mm -hmm. I was looking like, okay, if everybody's got a tradition, well, whose tradition is oldest, whose tradition is most authoritative, whose tradition really has a claim on every Christian. And what I found is that, that the Catholic tradition really is uh, old enough and, and, and verifiable and, and authentic enough that it really lays claim on every baptized person. Right. One thing I would say, Joe, we're going to take a break for, for a minute. But one thing I would say before we go to the break is if you're going to be sola scriptura, OK, then you have to be honest. Jesus prayed to the father that we all be one. OK, the Catholic Church is one. We have our problems, but the Catholic Church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. OK, and you just mentioned, John, with all respect to, again, our evangelical friends. OK, 50,000 denominations, each disagreeing on even the smallest thing. That is not unity. That is not a day, that is not an answer to a call to Christ's prayer that we all be one, because the, that community is decidedly not one. And it bears out in the numbers. But let's uh, let's take a break real quick. Uh, you're listening to The Front Line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Resinello. We're way in the breach with Dr. John Bergsman. We're talking about his new book, The Word of the Lord, Reflections on the Sunday Mass Readings for Year C. You're listening to us on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, serving the New York metropolitan area, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith. And make sure you download uh, the Veritas Catholic Radio Network mobile app and wherever you see Joe and I on um, on social media, primarily on YouTube at the Frontline TV. Please like, subscribe, share, do something that's going to help us out. Uh, we, we'd be greatly appreciated. And stick around. We've got another interesting segment with Dr. John Bergsma. Don't go anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, that... Uh... 
Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Racinello. In the breach with Dr. John Bergsma. Uh, welcome back to the program, Dr. John Bergsma, who is a friend of the show. We're talking about his new book, The Word of the Lord, Reflections on the Sunday Mass Readings for Year C. John, before I hand it over to Joe, where can people buy the book? We'll mention it again before the end of the show. Yeah, absolutely. So most online booksellers do have the book, uh, but I recommend you go to the St. Paul Center. Okay, just type that in a, a search line, St. Paul Center, uh, you can say for biblical theology, that's the full title. And uh, that will take you to, uh, I think it's stpaulcenter.com. Uh, That'll take you there. And we've got an online store and you can, you can buy it directly from us. And, and that benefits the most, uh, benefits us the most. So if you want to help us out and keep great books like this coming out, you know, come right to our website and uh, and check out the book at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology or just the St. Paul Center. You can find it in a couple of clicks. Awesome. Joe Restinello, where are we headed? On the other side of the break, John, we were talking about Sola Scriptura. And for those who may be just joining us, John is a scripture scholar and he has a Protestant background. And as we all know, uh, Protestants embrace this idea of the Bible, Sola Scriptura. I want to share with you a little story when I, I was telling you on the other side of the break that I went to a non-denominational Bible study. And I want to basically touch on a word that you said, authority. You know, you were open, you see, to authority and that question, because I think that question leads us to Rome, the Catholic Church. In that study, I can remember someone talking about once saved, always saved. And I said to the person, that's not biblical. There are tons of scripture passages that basically say that that is not correct. And he disagreed with me. So I said, next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Take the Bible that's in your hand, and I'm going to write down all the scripture passages that basically say what you're saying is incorrect. And I did. And when I got there the next week, I tried to slide that across the table. Literally, it was like I was putting poison in front of him. He pushed it away. And he was just like, I can't. He just was like, get that out of my face. I'm like, that's the Bible. Talk about the idea of bending the knee to authority, because that example always resonates with me. I was showing him something and it, it wasn't about me and him. It was in the Bible and they wouldn't look at it. Please comment on that, because I'm sure you could go on forever about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. So uh, what, what, what that puts me in mind of, of a true story from my own experience. Now, I, it, this is so unbelievable that, you know, you, you, you know, but I, I'm not making this up. Okay. This actually happened to me. So I was, I was in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. Which is the center for, you know, Dutch Calvinism in North America. There's a lot of theological schools, a lot of publishing houses out there in, in Western Michigan. And, uh, and there was this, this famous theologian in the city that was highly respected. And he was, he was elderly you know, he was in like his 80s, but he had had a really fabulous career. And um, and on Saturday afternoons, he would have people over to his house and he would just like talk about theology and and, and young younger theologians and and uh, students and stuff like that would come over there to listen to this guy. So I had an older friend who was a friend of this famous theologian, this famous Protestant theologian. And he said, you know, I could take you over you know, for these, for these afternoon, you know, get togethers and, and you can hear this guy. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, he's famous, like, bring me along. So I go over and we're all gathered around in this guy's living room and we're listening to him talk. And uh, as I, as I'm listening to him talk, I find out that he's not going to church anymore, except when his wife makes him. And, uh, and I'm like, what's that all about? And, and he come to find out, uh, he, didn't feel like he had anything to learn anymore from these younger pastors that were around in the town because he had taught some of them, you know, and he had been around so hard and he didn't have anything to, to learn. But, but his wife would like, you know, make him come to church and, and, and that's why he would go. And then I, I listened to him talk about stuff and I just picked up from him this kind of, you know, kind of like a swagger that he had. And, and at one point he said, I don't need to be attached to any denomination or any church. I can just be a universal Christian like Billy Graham and the Pope, 
<laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, first of all, Billy Graham is very faithful to whatever uh, denomination he belonged to. And secondly, the Pope, like he clearly has an identity with a particular church. And like, how does, what are you, what are you talking about? So I was getting so irritated with this older theologian that finally I, I got up the courage to actually you know you you have a problem and your problem is you are making yourself your own arbiter and judge of the truth and i thought that was a pretty sophisticated thing to say because i used the big word arbiter arbiter <laughs> i'm like oh I, I used a big word you know so i felt pretty good to myself and i sat back down and the theologian looked at me and and didn't miss a beat and he said well that is the protestant principle isn't it and i like what my jaw drops and i'm like what that never occurred to me it mm -hmm. never occurred to me that the logical consequence of protestantism is that everybody is their own judge of the truth in other words everybody's their own pope and i was young and naive and i didn't realize that was the the way that protestantism ends up but he had been around for 85 years and and he understood that but then the shocking thing was he was okay with it but i wasn't okay with it you know and so i i i kind of left a few minutes after that in, in silence and and we we i rode home with my friend in like a totally silent car because I was processing that. I'm like, is that really the logical outcome of sola scriptura and, and um, sola fide and so on? And, and brothers, eventually, you know, I realized, yeah, the older, that older theologian, he was arrogant, but he, did, he was not naive. And he did realize where you end up when you take that principle, because you cast off tradition, you cast off the church, and then who's to make the decision about what the word of God means? Why just little old you? And so you become, you know, the, the judge of, of what's true. And, and that leads to kind of the chaos that we see in society, because in America, you know, th that's why we've got all these moral problems, because everybody thinks that they can decide for themselves whatever the truth is. They don't have to bow the knee to authority. And, and, and so it's the logical outcome of our uh, Protestant culture. Isn't that the sin of Adam and Eve, though, from the yes. tree? of? I mean, it goes right back to that. I decide what's right and wrong. You have everything else, but I, God, decide what's right and wrong. And they were like, eh, no. And that's what we do today. That's right. what that gentleman was doing. That's what we do. No, no. You made the ocean. You made the Himalayas. But you know something? On abortion, you're wrong. <clears throat> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. When it says the, the snake says you will know good and evil. And a, a bunch of scholars point out that that has the sense of you're going to determine good and evil. So part of what the snake was offering them was, oh, you eat this fruit and you're going to be divine uh, omniscience. You're going to have this divine wisdom. Of course, they don't get divine, uh, you know, divine knowledge and stuff like that. He over he oversells uh, his product uh, there, but uh but they do, you know, go astray because they they attempt they're attempting to determine what's right and wrong for themselves rather than following what their loving father uh, instructs them. You know, it's, it's funny as you guys are talking, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, um, we, there there's a United newly elected elected United States senator who basically came out and said that you know. Christianity and abortion and my version of Christianity are just they square perfectly fine. And that seems to me to be a, a perfect example of what you guys are talking about. In other words, there is no subjective interpretation of Christian uh, of Christianity. It is not um, horizontal. It's vertical, comes from the top down. OK, and as Joe said, the problem is authority. Nobody wants to say I remember I forgot who it was who when I was on my journey back to the church or beginning to practice the faith again. Uh, uh, when I first heard, uh, I think Joe, uh, Joe, remind me, was it Francis of Assisi who said, said to the Lord, um, Lord, I know who you are. I know who I am and I'm not you. Yeah. And that's something I think people need to learn. 
Right. That, Am I right? That about involves that, humility. I mean, it comes down to the authority question. Ultimately, it's bending the knee. When I used to teach RCIA, I always used to say to people, God's house is heaven and it's his rules. It's not mine. If I want to go in, I have to listen to him. Just like if I want to go into John's house, if he tells me to take off my shoes, he has every right to. So I have to take my shoes off. Well, heaven is God's house and that requires humility. Um, and, you know, that's, to be honest with you, for the great as well as the simple, we have to be humble to accept God's word and accept his authority. And since we're talking about authority, John, just from an educational perspective, uh, could you talk about the authority of the Catholic Church? Because we have three sources. We have the magisterium, we have scripture, and we have apostolic tradition. How do they all work in unison as opposed to the sola scriptura approach? Sure, absolutely. So um, what we find is that it's it's like, um, uh, you know, the saying in the book of Ecclesiastes that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. What I experienced as a Protestant was that Protestantism was basically a cord of one strand. You know, it, it was the scripture. And uh, that is easily broken. And even in the little community, 90s, you know, we just had this little neighborhood of maybe 4,000 people in the center of town. And there were uh, at least a half a dozen little churches just in that one neighborhood. And I met the other pastors because it was such a small neighborhood. And one of us, you know, I was teaching that you should baptize your children, but another pastor was saying, no, that's absolutely wrong. You got to wait till you're an adult to be baptized. And another pastor was saying, you've got to speak in tongues. Otherwise, uh, you're not really a Christian, and so on and so on. Everybody had their own gospel that they were getting. And at first, I was naive, and I thought that, well, my fellow pastors here in this neighborhood, they just haven't looked at the same verses from Scripture that I've, that I've looked at. You know, so I would try to persuade them by citing Scripture to them that I thought backed up my beliefs. And I found out that, oh, they've got their verses, you know, so they got their verses for adult baptism. I've got my verses for infant baptism and it's verses versus verses. If you're following me and that's what you end up with in Sola Scriptura is verses versus verses. But again, getting back to your question, Joe, of, you know, we have scripture, we've got the tradition and we've got the magisterium and they testify to one another. They are mutually supporting. So the, um, the Bible supports both the magisterium, which is the church's teaching authority and tradition. In, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, St. Paul says, hold fast to the traditions that we taught you. Okay, so that's scripture testifying to the importance of tradition. And then in Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, uh, you are the rock, upon this rock I'll build my church, etc. cetera. Uh, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven what you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. Joe and Joe, that binding loosing language, that's totally lost on us Americans because we're not first century Jews. But in the first century in Jewish culture, binding and loosing meant the authority that, um, that rabbis had to interpret the word of God. And, and what Jesus is doing is he's investing Peter with the authority to interpret the word of God, to bind and to loose. To bind means to forbid something on the basis of scripture, and to loose means to permit something on the basis of scripture. So that was an authority that had been given to the priests by Moses, but then in the first century, the Pharisees had taken over that role illegitimately. They had usurped it from the priesthood, but Jesus gives that authority to Peter. And then what we, what we see in the book of Acts is that Peter and the apostles, they share their authority. Translations as elders, but he, they, the apostles share their authority with the presbyters. And that's the word that we get priests from. And so that's the beginning of the priesthood and what we call apostolic succession. This succession of authority figures that come down to us from from the apostles. And so that's the magisterium of the church. And so scripture testifies to both tradition and the magisterium. Then, you know, the church's teaching is magisterium 
tells us that the scripture is the word of God. That's like the document Dei Verbum from Vatican II. It testifies to the word of God. That's the magisterium testifying to the word of God. The tradition testifies to the word of God. You know, the, the fathers, the doctors of the church, again, the saints, they're constantly testifying to the power of the word of God. So um, you've got uh, tradition. Uh, well, you got the magisterium testifying to the word of God. You got the magisterium testifying to tradition as well. You know, and so it, it's mute. They are mutually self-supporting. Okay. The fathers and the tradition testify to the teaching authority of the church and scripture. Scripture testifies to the other two, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's mutually self-supporting. And that, and I found that that's so strong because, you know, you, you get, you get, uh, secular Bible scholars like Bart Ehrman. Some of our listeners will recognize his name because he's written some New York Times bestsellers, like a book called Misquoting Jesus, where he freaks out Protestant Christians by pointing to the fact that there's, uh, you know, some, uh, some parts of the New Testament where we're not sure what the original word was. Uh, and and that, that freaks out some Protestant readers but when you're a Catholic, you know that your faith doesn't depend on, you know, uh, uh, one verse here or one verse there and, and, and some doubt about what an original Greek word was in the epistle to the Romans or something like that. Your faith is based on, on this huge river. It's like the Mississippi River flowing. You got magisterium, you got tradition, you've got the scriptures, they're all flowing. And so a little, uh, you know, an eddy on the side of the river is not going to like uh, mess stuff up because you've got this huge flow of the word of God through history to depend on. I think it's so important for people to understand. If you're just joining us, you're at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello. We're having a fantastic conversation with Dr. John Bergsma about his new book, The Word of the Lord Reflections on the Sunday Mass Readings for Year C. John, see, you hit this like when Joe talks about authority. And you're and you're and 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 and, and just uh, piggybacking off of what you just said. You know what I hear? I hear this. I don't get freaked out over that word. You want to know why? Because the church doesn't get freaked out over that word. Because superior minds in the Catholic Church, Augustine comes to mind, and many other, uh, you know, uh, earlier than him, they've already hashed this out. If the church says it, my world is not going to get turned upside down because a different translation of a Greek word, um, you know, starts coming our way. No. I trust in the authority of the church, okay, that says, no, this is the correct interpretation of, of this particular parable or this particular right. teaching of Jesus right. or whatever the case would be. It's so important. It gives us peace. You it know, does. when you know, it's like having, we have the greatest king, all right? We have right. Jesus Christ. He gave us a church. It gives us the greatest peace. I don't have to struggle with a lot of this stuff because as my brother-in-law, Joe Resinello says all the times, it's written down. It's yeah. written down. Just open your heart and open your mind to it. That's the way I yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the church father origin said that the scriptures are more truly written on the heart of the church than they are on the written page. And what, what, the, what the church father origin was trying to emphasize by that is um, the, the, the saints and the faithful throughout the ages have, um, they have digested the word of God and, and understood it and lived it out. And so again, like you said, Joe, I'm not gonna get freaked out by some scholar that comes along and has got a weird uh, interpretation of a certain Greek word because I've got the testimony and the example of St. Paul and St. Irenaeus and St. Augustine and St. Francis of Assisi and St. Therese of Lisieux. And they have lived out this faith and they lived it out faithfully and they've changed the world in their times. And they, they have lived holiness, unimpeachable holiness. Like you, you the, the, many, many of the saints, you, you can't, you know, what can you say against St. Teresa of Calcutta, for example? Okay, such an example of holiness. Well, what she did was she took the word of God and she put it into action. And the same faith that inspired all of these saints from the past, I can trust it to, to lead me to heaven, to lead me to communion with God. It's not, you know, dangling by the interpretation of a, of a verse here or a verse there. You know, you, you hit it on the head. I follow the example of the saints. Why? Because the proof is in the pudding. And you're right. 
They shook the foundations of the world, these people. Why? Because they just listened to what was told to them, like Forrest Gump. How do you put that gun together, Gump? Because you told me to do it. That's how I, some people say, oh, you're a sheep. You're a simpleton. Well, you know something? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And whenever the authority question comes up, I always say this to people. When you rise from the dead, I'll listen to you. Until then, <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. He founded one church and I'm listening to it. And you see this, John, I'll tell you, honestly, it comes down. It's a grace. But like you see it on like the quote unquote right of the church, the, the, the very orthodox and the very liberal. Just listen. It's all written down. It's not your church. Just listen to it. And as as scripture tells us, I am the vine and you are the branch. If you adhere to me, you will bear fruit and the saints prove it. You hit it right on the head. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. John, let's um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the Eucharist. OK, um, it seems like and again, because I, I don't think people are getting into maybe, you know, John six um, understanding. Maybe they're a little ambivalent about the church's teaching or they don't believe fully that it's really Jesus. OK, um, and many people who might be listening to us right now at the front line with Joe and Joe, that's not a judgmental statement, but that we are bound to believe that that is truly the presence of Jesus Christ on the altar. And, and quite frankly, John, I think people need to 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 really think about that, because that's such an that is probably the most important teaching of the church, or at least top five. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about the need to understand scripture vis-a-vis um, -vis the Eucharist, the need to emphasize the Catholics. No, it's not a symbol. OK, it doesn't look I know it looks like but it's not bread. That is Jesus Christ. Talk about that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I love to talk with. I wish we had another hour to talk about this. But first of all, brothers, it was the Eucharist that converted me to Catholicism. You know, I was a Protestant pastor. I had two master's degrees from one of the hardest seminaries in America. Um, I was very well educated in my faith. And here, I, I, like I told you, I met this friend, my Catholic friend, Michael, and, and he challenged me on the Eucharist. And he pointed out that the literal sense of the New Testament, every time it speaks of the Eucharist, the literal sense is that it simply is the body of Jesus. And he challenged me on that and says, like, why don't you believe that? Why do you always interpret these passages as being metaphorical? And I pondered that and, and, and it was like, oh gosh, the shoe is on the other foot now because the usual Protestant criticism of, uh, of us as Catholics is that we don't take the scriptures in their literal sense, or we don't take them in the plain sense, et cetera. We're trying to get around the meaning of the word of God. And, and here I'm like, this is so ironic because my Catholic friend is pointing to me clearly, like, like, like you said, Joe, like those scriptures that your friend didn't want to look at, you know, it's in the Bible and he, he pushes it away. I'm like, he's showing me these scriptures and, and I'm trying to deny their sense. But, but this, this is what really got me. My friend Michael got me to read the earliest pastors, the earliest Christian pastors. Okay, we call them the early pastors who uh, lived, whose lives overlapped with the apostles themselves. One of them, his name was Ignatius, and he was the, he was the bishop of the entire church in uh, the city of Antioch in Syria. <clears throat> and he got arrested by the Roman authorities for being a church leader, and he was sent to Rome. And we're talking about the year 106. It's that early, 106, okay? So he's being taken to Rome, and he writes letters to local churches as he passes through these different cities on his way to be eaten by the lions. And he passed through this city called Smyrna, and he wrote a letter to local church. And one of the things he said to them was, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and the Father in his goodness raised up uh, for our salvation. And I read that, okay? I read that uh, because I was given a copy of, Ignatius of letter, uh, Ignatius's letters from my friend, Michael. And I read that and I realized, oh my goodness, if I was put in a time machine and went back to the first century, I would not have been considered a true Christian 
because I knew in my heart that I was denying that the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus, which suffered and which was raised. And in about a day and a half, about 36 hours after I read that testimony from this early church pastor who knew the apostle John himself and, and who died giving a testimony to his faith by being eaten by lions in the Colosseum in Rome. And this early pastor said, the true faith is the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus, which suffered and which, which uh, was raised. That is foundational. And, and brothers, it's not only that, but it's that um, Jesus calls the Eucharist the new covenant. In Luke 22, 20, he says, this cup, holding up the Eucharistic cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is the new covenant. Let, don't, let's not do a Bill Clinton thing here and say, what does is, what is, is mean, okay? <laughs> But this is the new covenant in my blood, which means consisting of my blood. Okay, so he identifies the Eucharistic blood as the new covenant that also applies to the Eucharistic bread, the Eucharistic body. Okay, so that is the, the new covenant. Now, New Testament is just Latin for new covenant. Testamentum is the Latin word for covenant. We've got a bunch of American Christians running around calling themselves New Testament Christians, right? New Testament Christians. That's a phrase that you will hear in Protestant to the New Testament Christian. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're a New Testament Christian and all you're doing is reading. But if you're not participating in the Eucharist, but you're calling yourself a New Testament Christian, you're like the person that goes to the Chinese restaurant, studies the whole menu and never orders General Tso's chicken. Nice. Okay? You don't, you're not getting the point of the menu <laughs> because the Bible is a series of covenants. You know, many Bible scholars will tell you that. It all culminates. You got a covenant with Adam, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and it all covenant culminates with the new covenant of Jesus. Okay, but, the, but Jesus himself, according to the Bible, According to the New Testament, he identifies the Eucharist as the new covenant. So all of our listeners, if you want to be a New Testament Christian, if you want to be a Bible Christian, okay, you've got to take the Eucharist because that's what Jesus himself identifies as the new covenant because it is himself. It's his body and blood. And, and we, a covenant is a family relationship. People don't get that. It's a family relationship that you form by swearing an oath with someone. You, you swear a solemn oath and you take them as your family member. And that oath by which Jesus makes us his family members is the Eucharist. And it's the perfect oath uh, ritual because he's giving us his body and blood. You are what you eat. When we eat it, we become his bones and flesh. We become his body. We are united to him as his family. That's the meaning of the Eucharist. It makes us the family of God. And this is the saving truth for all humanity. This is what everybody needs to hear all around the world. Russia, China, Vietnam, Africa, South America. Everybody needs to take Jesus in the Eucharist because this is what binds us together into one family of God. Amen. John, John, I, we have to come bring it to an end. We have a minute. So there's no better place to end it. Amen, brother. Um, and we recommend everybody who's listening to this, especially on podcast, share the podcast with your friends. OK, because what John has to say is very important. Um, John, once again, where do people buy the book or and any yeah. of your books? Yes, please. Uh, you can go to CatholicBibleTeacher.com and uh, that'll redirect to my website and you can go to my store and you can buy it there or type in St. Paul Center uh, into a search line and look for uh, the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology with me and Dr. Scott Hahn. And you can go to our store there and get the book too. Awesome. Thank you so much, John Bergson, for being on the front line with Joe and Joe. And thank all of you out there for joining us on the Veritas Catholic Network, 1350 on your AM dial, serving the New York metropolitan area, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith. Make sure you download the Catholic, Veritas Catholic Radio Network mobile app so that you can have access to all of our station's content. And please, wherever you see Joe and I on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Frontline TV, Frontline with Joe and Joe, wherever you see our ugly jersey mugs, please like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. And remember, until the next time, that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.